moment I joined the company, most of the people had like PhD. But I don't have. <laughs> uh, so yeah, today together with Arthur, we're gonna talk about so maybe yeah, I'm yeah. going to give myself to this yourself. Uh, yeah, so I'm Arthur. I'm studying currently at KTH as a master student in theoretical physics. I'm doing uh, a lot of machine learning in parallel, and particularly I'm doing like a research a research project on domain adaptation with Hossein, who is like the same supervisors on Sebastian at KTH, uh, the RPL laboratory. Uh, and so we're going to talk about uh, two subjects who are like very entangled: uh, domain adaptation and image translation. So uh, before we start, I'd like to ask you a little question: like, can you recognize this image? Yes. If you're from Stockholm, you probably can. It's like the the castle at uh, the royal palace at Gamastan. So most of you can actually recognize it. Even if you maybe you have never seen like this painting or you have never seen any painting of the castle, but you've probably seen, I don't know, some picture, you've probably gone to Gamlastan and seen the real castle. And what you can do is like transfer between the different domains. So what we call a domain is basically different style information about an image, about like a sort of data set. Like a domain is a data set with basically a common feature. So for instance, uh, colored photos are domain, black and white photos are domain, paintings are domain, etc. And the ability to be able to transfer between the different domains is called domain adaptation. So to be a bit more precise, domain adaptation is where you have two data sets, but one task on those two data sets. So, for instance, imagine you have the two data sets are paintings and photos of cats and dogs, and you have only the label in one of the data sets. So, the one where we have labels is called the source, usually, and the one where we don't have, or where we have like really few labels, is, is called the target domain. And one, what we want to do is to be able to make predictions on the target domain without any label on it, just by using the transfer between the source domain and the target domain. So if you can build the models that recognize the cats and dogs on the source, like on the photos, can you also do it on the page? So yeah, and uh, there is also a very related problem of like image to image translation, but uh, these are image to image translation and domain adaptation like kind of, uh, they're related, but they like kind of perpendicular to each other, and uh, and image to image translation. There's basically methods are like methods that translate what images from let's say one domain to another domain. So example could be that you have a sketch of an image, and uh, you produce like a, like real image of a cat of a cat, and of course. The image to image translation methods uh, are like one of the ways to, to do domain adaptation because you can translate the images from one domain to look as uh, the images from the other domain. So, for example, if you have the domain made of synthetic images or paintings, you just translate it to look as like uh, photos. And uh, and yeah, like the recent development of uh, image to image translation methods, kind of enabled more creative use of it, more creative. It's one of the ways of, of doing domain adaptation. But uh, yeah, the image to image translation it's it's kind of like a slightly different area because. Uh, it relates to, so it, the goal is just to translate images. In domain adaptation, you, you, you assume that you want to do some tasks. You, you want to do well on the tasks. So well, classification yeah. or detection or, or something like that. But, but image to image translation, you can just do it like for fun to have funny yes. images or 
cuts or like colorization can be used in translation because you go from grayscale image and then you want to have it in cores, okay? Or super resolution, you have uh, an image in like low quality, but you, you want to produce like high resolution image, high quality. Um, and you might have heard of uh, transfer learning. And so there is like a strong link between transfer learning and domain adaptation in the sense that transfer, uh, domain adaptation is part of transfer learning, where you have a task, which is the same between the two domains as I, as I explained before. So in like general transfer learning, what you usually do, for instance, is you pre-train a network or model on some data sets, like on ImageNet, for instance, and you use that same model for another data set, but like with another task, which can be like a very, very different data set. But like in domain adaptation, you specifically have to have the same task between the domains. So there are plenty of applications of domain adaptation. Uh, I've actually started domain adaptation with high energy physics, where you have um, you have like simulations and real data. So you have like the data produced by the LHC, for instance, and uh, simulated data by Monte Carlo. And usually, usually, like there is a sort of bias between the two between the two domains, and you want to to learn that bias and to be able to to learn on mostly on simulated data because you have a lot of simulated data you can produce like as many as you want and then transfer your knowledge to the real data. It's kind of, uh, you can also do like some domain adaptation in biology, where you have like you know, different type of machines, different, and you just want to, uh, to be able to adapt between those different machines that produce like maybe different kind of data that looks the same, that represents the same, but not exactly. So you want to be able to transfer to those domains. Uh, there is also like simulation based reality if you want to build like autonomous uh, driving and uh, you, you can produce like as many simulations as you want and then try to recognize stuff on the simulations and with the adaptation transfer that to reality. Uh, some people are also applying the adaptation to sentiment analysis uh, where you have like different category of reviews for example of Amazon reviews. And you want to transfer, I know, from like DVDs to computers, etc., because it's like it represents kind of the same thing, like positive or negative reviews. But for the the, the reviews would be a bit different, the text would be a bit different, so you can maybe adapt between the two. You can also use like if you have different cameras, different images like taken with different machines. Uh, you can also like try to learn if you are much more level for one kind of camera. You can use that to learn on the other kind of camera. So I want to focus a bit on like one of the applications, which I'm like mostly working with like personally. And it's about like Synthetic data and real data because, like, as you know, like deep learning often requires like a lot of lot of data and it needs to be labeled and so on. So, we have like ImageNet, which is super big and it does labels, but it requires a uh, really big effort to do that because first you need to like capture all the images and so on, and then you need to find people who actually annotate them. And uh, give them labels. Oh, this is image of a cat, dog, and, and so on. And uh, that's kind of an issue. Of course, for like the very typical task that you actually have, the data sets ready, like cats and dogs, that, that's really easy. But uh, for some of the cases, that might be really an issue, like labeling data, especially that if you think about like medical problems. You, you really need to have like a, there are like very few human human experts that are capable of labeling those images and so on and uh, yeah that, that's an issue but especially like in computer vision there was also like uh, people always wanted to use just like synthetic data because it's it's relatively easy to generate it you have like yeah like video games basically generate 
set of images. So, like, since the images are rendered, the rendered because like you have like you can you have three D scene constructed of everything where is the buildings are, where where the cars are, and so on. You you have perfect information about the environment because you created it. So the really big advantage is that you have, you you know the ground truth of everything. But I You can just have it. But uh, the problem is that if you try, it, then uh, the performance will be really wrong because uh, the data distribution is, is different. The, what you train on, the synthetic data distribution is different of the, the real data distribution. So, but the domain shift between the distributions. So in this case, it's like you can use the synthetic data only for limited, in a limited way. And, uh, and it's not only a matter of like uh, expensive to annotate, because some, in particular, you can't, it's really tough to image, to just label the images if the things are like occluded. So, an example of this hand, like, if you ask like people to annotate, then uh, it might be problematic. And, and in particular, there is also no like 3D information on the images. Maybe you need that, maybe you want to have it. And, uh, so, yeah, if you could like really benefit from synthetic data, like use it in a robust way, then that would really benefit the field because you have perfect information of everything and maybe you can even enable it to to learn the tasks that were not used before. For example, as we this like hand pose estimation. Because what they did is like they they had like the, the hands which were generated and they use, and they come with perfect ground proof, like together with like occluded parts and so on. And they use like image translation methods to make it look real, those images. And then they train on that. And then they have had really, really good results in that. So, yeah, so the idea is to, to take synthetic data and make it look real, right? Because we 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 like kind of refine the data to, to look real. Because because we have perfect ground proof of everything on on the synthetic image. But if we manage to make it look like this, then maybe we should uh, still train our deep nets or on those images, and then the performance will will be good on the, the actual images. So what you see here, it's the synthetic image that was translated to as, uh, as actual photo. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a way to do it. So there are different uh, types of domain adaptation. Um, first, the most common is the unsupervised domain adaptation, where the source is fully adult and the target doesn't have any adult. That's what most people do. But there are also like two kind of recent fields of domain adaptation, where you have uh, some only few levels for the target, and you want to be able to generalize and target sets uh, with uh, those few levels. And future domain adaptation, where you don't only have two levels for the target, but you also have two samples. But in all cases, like the source is pretty valid by definition. And it's kind of similar with image translation methods, because you can have like supervised means that you have two data sets which have like correspondences to the images. So 
you can might have like grayscale image and the same image in color, but on the other hand, you can have like unsupervised problem. So you have this set of synthetic images and set of realistic images, and they they don't have they correspond to different scenes and, and so on. So I see we have more people coming. Uh, you all like sandwiches? If you got some, some drinks. Yeah, but uh, if you got that, like, feel free to ask, interrupt us, and ask questions like whenever you want. <coughs> so first, I can talk about like supervising some translation methods because it's kind of how the thing started. So we have supervision, as I mentioned, means that you have correspondences between. So they, you have two data sets representing the same, the same, you have samples which represent the same thing. So black and white to the color, and you have sketch to the graphical color, and uh, so on. So, in particular, this is not really, these are not really the data sets, these are like outputs of the translation method. So, this was. This is an image that was generated from this input. So as you see, it can actually perform pretty well. <clears throat> but the downside is that you will actually need to have data sets with correspondences. And that that might be that uh, sometimes might be really an issue. Because if you want to have like translate images of horses to root as not horses but to zebras, let's say, then the, then it's kind of impossible practically to construct a data set of images of horses and then zebras standing in the same pose, in the same scene and And uh, we're later going to like talk more about GANs, but uh, what these methods use, they, they use like conditional GANs. So we condition, uh, basically, by condition, I mean you, to the generator, you pass a sam sample from the, the source domain, and the discriminator sees like a pair of images. If we come back to that. But for unsupervised problem, it's, as I mentioned, it's a bit more challenging because you don't really have the relation between samples present in the data. <clears throat> but it's impossible to, to, to get this performance. Yeah. So on the left side, you have like synthetic image, and on the right side, you, can, you have actually like real image like that. Forum the station. And uh, this comes from like a synthetic data set. And uh, this, is, this is like a data set that was, uh, that was made just from like photos of the car driving around different cities. <clears throat> so, okay, of course, both these data sets do not have like, they correspond to different things <coughs> and so on. But uh, we hope to still use it to, to, to be able to translate the content from this image to, to, to preserve the content within translation, but, uh, but kind of express it as a real form. That's the goal. Okay, so now we've seen uh, what domain attention in image translation. more precisely mathematically. So uh, the classical model of domain adaptation has been set up in 2010 by Ben David. Uh, and he adopts the probabilistic perspective, mostly frequencies, where you have like uh, two distribution, one for the source and one for the target, or for the samples are located. And 
you try to model uh, you, you like the hypothesis you have is that there is a discrepancy between the two domains. So uh, I will explain like this formula, the, the general uh, idea of this formula, but there are some details that you don't need, especially need to understand for the, 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 the following parts. This like it's a bit hard. So, mm -hmm. so uh, you have you have like a space of hypothesis because like I said like you have a task on your data set, so you have some hypothesis sets. And uh, the distance between the different domains. And like some constants that mostly depends on like the VC dimension of your hypothesis space. So it's like basically the complexity of, uh, of the, the hypothesis space. So what you want to do in domain adaptation is to find a certain translation between the source space and the target space that minimize distance and the target points and you you want to find a hypothesis h that should be that will perform well on the source uh, on the source data sets basically so you first want to have like a good hypothesis on the source and then to translate the target like imagine you translate the, the painting to the photos for instance so that if you if you have a good model for the photo, you translate the painting to the photos, then you don't have a good model for the photos. So that's basically what this formula is saying. Yeah. And so what was X from the source? The error, the, the, the test error on the target domain for the, the hypothesis H and on the source domain. Test error. Test error. Test error. Yeah. So of course like you, you would have the It's uh, the target error relates to the source error, error and like discrepancy. So I'll try to explain a bit like how this formula works. Uh, but it's okay if you don't understand. It's fine. <laughs> so basically, uh, what you what you want in this formula is to find the sup over two hypotheses. So you have like two hypotheses. Let's say it's a classification problem. So you have like the, the first domain here, the second domain here. And what you want to do is to find two hypotheses that performs, uh, that have, are very different for one domain, but very similar for the other domain. So here we have this hypothesis, the two hypotheses are like exactly the same for the target domain. Like the two hypotheses classify them as blue. But for the source domain, it's, it gives exactly the contrary uh, in terms of classification. So if you manage to find two hypotheses that perform like very in a very different way for the source and the target, it means that you have a, a big distance between the two uh, between the two domains. So that's one kind of distance. Yeah. <laughs> It would be so you would have like uh, I don't know the synthetic data here, the so real data here, and the hypothesis would be just like some separation you want to, to maximize on the hypothesis. So it would be just like classify some of the samples in one category and the other sample in the other category. It's like just not the We wanted to like clarify like what's like the difference between like just the image translation and then another patient. But you can think about the image translation as a way to like minimize the discrepancy between data sets. And on domain adaptation, you also have this uh, source hypothesis and other Yeah, okay. Well, now, now I do this. I guess it might be discrepancy between data sets. Uh, but I mean, you can't change data sets, you mean that. So you map it by process. That's right. here. Like you have a translation here, so we try to minimize the distance between the lines. So translating target as a source. You can minimize, you find mapping. And then on this instance, when you say that you want to find the hypothesis that maximizes the discrepancy, that's I love the distance. Do mean that the definition of the distance is the 
largest discrepancy of the whole possible hypothesis. That way yeah. we want to find. And then the next step is to minimize this maximum. I mean, so exactly. minimize something which is a maximum of something. Yeah. Yes, that's it. We want to minimize this distance, which is defined by maximum. Oh, yeah. yeah. But actually, we can't really uh, compute. I mean, it's like very hard to compute this distance. Computationally, it's intractable. So uh, if it's hard to compute, it's also hard to minimize, like to have gradient, etc. And we have to find other distances that kind of approximate this distance. And for that, in domain adaptation, we use what we call divergences, which are basically some sort of distances, but with like less properties. So what we want is like that if you have two distributions, uh, you want this divergence to be positive. And if the two distributions are equal, then uh, the distance has to be equal. It's like a unique order. So yeah, it's divergence. And uh, examples of divergences are like KL divergence, Wasserstein distance, JS divergence, and like the procedure, the algorithm of uh, inventing a domain adaptation algorithm is to find to choose a divergence and to try to minimize it. So like most of domain adaptation uh, algorithm just consists in like saying, okay, we'll choose this divergence. And we'll minimize the divergence. So we find a map between the source and the targets that minimize the divergence. So we'll start by um, explaining like one, one algorithm that uses like a special divergence called the passage time distance. Uh, so it's based on optimal transport, which is um, an area of maps in the like, beginning of the 19th century. But uh, which regained interest uh, those last years in machine learning and in the robot recently. So uh, the idea is you have two distributions. So let's imagine it's like just discrete distributions. You have PR and PQ which represent like source and target. And what you want to do is to transport one of the distribution into the other. So imagine the distributions are just like some Earths. And you take, you, what you want to do is like imagine you have like you're in the mind because it was formulated like that. You're in the mind, you have some earth and you want to put it on another side with like another shape. So you want to transform one shape into the other and you have some, for instance, some workers actually taking it and like changing the shape of the, um, of the heap. And what you want to do is to minimize the distance that your worker are actually uh, like the, the distance where, that they are transporting, and also the mass that they are transporting each time they, they like take a heap of Earth to another place. So what you do for that is you say, okay, we want to minimize, we want to find like a transport so that you you transport here. So in this in this image, you want to find like that sort of matrix. That take, for instance, like uh, a bit of this one, and that put it in that one. So, like each time it's red, it means that you put a part of this guy into the other guy. So, you want to find this transport that minimize here is the distance, and it's weighted by like the um, kind of the mass you take, and you want to find this gamma. So, you want to find what mass do you take in each part of the first distribution into the other distribution. So do you have any question about that? Yeah. The left square, um, well, I would say, one piece Yeah, this what, one? What do you see it represent? Yeah. It represents the mass you take, like, for instance, like, let's try, I don't know, this red part, right? This red part means that you take, uh, imagine, I don't know, the value is five here. So you take five kilograms of this guy, to put it on this guy, okay? So imagine like first it's like nothing, and then you put a bit of this mass here, you put like a bit of this mass here, a bit of this mass here, etc. So that at the end, like you manage to transport like this earth to the other guy, this heat to the other guy, like the other one. And this guy is like just distances. So it's like a cost. Okay. 
you say, okay, I want like, yeah, I want to minimize the distance of transports. But it can be other things, and you'll see actually we take some other kind of cost. Yeah, exactly, that's what cost there. Yeah. Patrick's. So, distance and mass and one distance. Distance, the other. Exactly. And what you want to find is the mass. So, that's like, to compute the mass of time and distance, you want to find the mass. The mass of time. And actually, finding that consists to uh, like a, a linear optimization problem because you can see that like this uh, equation is linear in gamma and in, uh, in the distance. So in the two metrics, so it's actually just finding gamma that minimizes uh, the, the scalar product in terms of matrices of, of the two matrices. Any question? So, uh, in the spatial case, where you have an empirical distribution, so you only have the points, you don't know like the real distribution of the data, but you have those points. Uh, the, the optimal transport solution will just be like a binary link. If you have the same number of points in the two, uh, in the two source and target, it should be just a uh, link between different points. So, you want to link them so that it minimizes the transport. So what you actually minimize is, for instance, like this solution is the total length of the means. It means that you transport like this because you can square this etc. so that you minimize the total length. And uh, in that case, uh, you will have this the gamma matrix, which will be either a zero or one, like do I make it or not? Uh, and if you have not the same number of points, uh, in that case, uh, you will have like a certain probability of assigning it to the different points. So if you have more red points, like if you have like this blue point, how is it going to be assigned to this one to this point? So it generalizes well uh, in the case of you know, how to assign number of points. But for simplicity, like we consider this case. Uh, so like there, there is a very recent algorithm, 2017, that uses optimal transport to do domain adaptation. So imagine you have like uh, the three classes and two domains. So the core domain is the source one, and the gray domain is the target one. You don't have the model on the gray domain. And so, what you want to do is to be able to predict, of course, the model of the target domain. So, it's an iterative algorithm. So, you just can like step by step. First, what you do is you consider a classifier, like for instance, here using SBM. On the, only on the source points. You don't consider the gray points. Then you assign pseudo models to the target points in function of like the, uh, the classifier you use. Then the next step is to find the transport point. So what you do is you transport every source point to target point so that you minimize the distance of transport, but also like you modify a bit the cost so that you, you want uh, as less as, as few as possible uh, of um, point being assigned to different regions. So, like, you don't want a lot of those blue points to go to the orange region, for instance. So, you consider the pseudo levels in that sense. Then, from that, you assign new uh, new pseudo levels to the target based on like the transport. So, like, each blue points, each source blue points. We begin to new new points, new target points. As you can see, like it's like the links that decide the color. This time. Uh, so that's a new solution. Then you start again. You train a classifier. You assign new pseudo levels, uh, and you can see like there is there might still be an ambiguity here at this point. Uh, so we start again. We see that actually it's linked to a green point. So it's going to be green. Then that's our new solution. We turn a new classifier. And we start again. And we see that now, now it's okay. Like, because it's um, a new color. So it has converged. Uh, yeah. So that basically is the idea. So it's in this case, like the, the translation of the means It is a word. It's the second name. The second name is like a Exactly. Yeah. That's like a very simple transformation. But there is a new paper of 
Yeah, it's 2018 actually, so 2017. Uh, it's like went out like two months ago, I think. And where they use the same the same ID, but uh, inserting a bit more deploying in it. So what they do is they actually uh, learn a memory space, so that they don't do like this optimal transport thing directly on the input space with like the input probabilities, but on a memory space. And for each uh, fixed transport plan, they learn the network that makes the network closing. So they will try like to transform the point, because in our case, we just transform the classifier, right? So in that case, they also transform the points so that the target point of closer the source point. So it's basically the idea, and it's actually. Uh, now we're talking about like another kind, uh, very different kind of uh, domain adaptation, adversarial domain adaptation. So it was kind of a revolution in domain adaptation in 2015, where like the, the scores uh, improved exponentially on benchmarks from that period. So the idea is to use GANs, I just playing what it is, to minimize uh, what we call the Jensen Shannon divergence. So it's based on the tail of the it's a bit complicated, I won't really explain what is here, but it might actually minimize divergence. And so the idea behind GANs and adversarial domain adaptation is that you have a generator that take as input target points. So you have a painting as input, and as output, you want a photo. And you also have a discriminator that try to separate the real samples, so the real photos, from the photo you produced. And then the generator try to make this discriminator perform badly. And so that's kind of a game uh, of mouse and cat between like, the discriminator and the generator, where like everyone, uh, like both the discriminator and the generator, try to improve uh, with the, uh, the output of the other. So the intuition is that the better the generator gets, the the stronger discriminator you need. And uh, if the discriminator, both of them are like, uh, have the same like, capacity, then uh, they actually uh, converge to the place that, uh, like, theoretically converge to the place that uh, the generated samples are indistinguishable from uh, the real samples. Absolutely. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so that's the kind of show in the place is not vector by due to the target uh, input. Uh, do you have any questions about that? Because we could a lot about that. We couldn't get it. Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, so you haven't. Uh, generative adversary on the uh, network. Uh, the generate things is like this adversarial training between the different uh, Yeah, so yeah, I can explain it like a very simple example. So, still the source and the target here. And the green points are actually like a, a transformation of the, of the target. And what you do is like you have this discriminator in the background. And you see that the discriminator try to classify between the like the target point and the source point, right? And now the generator will try to fool it. So you'll see that it try to go this way with the discriminator. Go this way. Now like the discriminator doesn't have the choice, like it was linear from the moment. So now we can't like we can discriminate between source and target with that. So it will try to evolve. Right. Now it's it managed to discriminate again. And now the generator evolved so that the uh, discriminator is in the discriminator. Uh, so, yeah, we can talk now about track speed. Yeah, the, the case of like the unsupervised that we might be more interested in. So, I uh, say if I Let's say we have like yeah, there's some random images of horses and just random images of zebras.
class, so we only find the C that we want to. So we're actually preserving the content, just, just changing the, uh, the like domain specific things. In this case. So, uh, Because if you have like an image, you can map image term from the file, but it, it doesn't have to like have the same content. So it's a it's a good idea to actually like constrain the space of possible translations. In order to let's say preserve the content of it, and uh, it's kind of uh, uh, difficult. Uh, the problem is defined the way that it's it's very difficult because how how could you constrain the the, the output of the content? So the the idea of like cycle down, uh, cycle down, they supposed to use the cycle consistency or something. Which was, I think, previously used in the machine translation classes. So it means that if you translate the sample from the source domain to the target domain and translate back to the source domain, then you should end up with the exact same thing. Okay? So in machine translation, like the, the example would be you have a sentence in English and you translate it. Translated to French, and then when you translate it back from French to English, you should end up uh, with the same sentence that you try to hold the whole process with. Make sense? Yes. Yeah, sure. But uh, I would say this is not really what you want. And even like with languages, you can. You can uh, you can find examples that you can't really have the cycle consistency because, like, if you can, let's say, express something in French and you translate it to English, you sometimes might lose the meaning of uh, you might lose some meaning. And uh, then you can't really translate it back. So, I could also relate to, like, the images that if you translate C, that divorce, you kind of lose the lot of information about the strike. So you can't really, you can't really bring it back. So that's that's kind of downside of this assumption. And uh, but it it constrains the the, the, the possible output in a still like pretty good way. So it's a still have to, but it's not ideal. And also. Uh, might be the case that okay, you have you have perfect cycle consistency, but the intermediate sample is just wrong. So, so if you have like the images in one style and the in the other style, okay, if you translate A with one and back to A, then okay, you have cycle consistency preserved, but the intermediate is just wrong. And in practice, there actually sometimes happens that, that within those image translations, you see some like hallucinated things on the intermediate image. But if you translate it back, it looks perfectly well. So uh, yeah, it's an approximate assumption, but it's still pretty helpful. I will have it in the application. And the uh, alternative control, for example, use like the Shared latent space, which is yeah, shared among the domains. <clears throat> and in particular, there was this paper from the unsupervised instant translation network unit. And, uh, and yeah, so the hypothesis we have shared latent uh, representation. 
and the model is like quite complex because uh, it might. So you have like basically two different variations of output coding. So, so you can think about this part as like an encoder, then that's your latent space, and then your decoder. So uh, yeah, out like the variation of output coder, just to make sure everyone so it encodes an image to some latent space, which is yeah, to some latent space, and then decodes and and uh, and should decode the same exact same thing. And you sometimes might use it for the uh, But uh, and then you have the same uh, like you have variation of encoder working on a with a different domain. So the thing about it like. Synthetic images, you encode it and then you decode it and should have the same output as your input. And then you have real image and, uh, and then you encode it with, with a separate encoders and decoders. But uh, the idea is that you introduce like the shared latent representation between these and uh, the dotted lines uh, represent like some partial weight sharing of the encoders and decoders. But if, because you have this shared latent space, what you can actually do is you can input like samples in one domain, let's say synthetic, and then while it's in the shared latent space, you can actually try to decode it with a decoder of the of the second domain. So you input synthetic sample and then intuitively what should be represented in the latent space is it should contain the content that is independent of, of the domain of the style or whatever. And then the decoder learns to produce like the image from it. And uh, so at the end, you have like the, for each domain, you have the discriminator, which then then, then tries to discriminate if the, the translated image looks as if it came from the target distribution or not. So, Uh, so the that's a good question. So the x x uh, so this one should mean that that you input x one and you decode it with the target domain decoder. So it should be expressed in the target domain. So if, if one means synthetic and two means like polite, realistic, then this should be synthetic sample translated to look realistic. But on the other hand, you get an input just real image, real photo of the like, second domain, and then decode it with, with this decoder, and, and yeah, then basically you got to reconstruct the same. Uh, we need to put those fake samples and the uh, real sample from the corresponding image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it takes real samples and uh, generates it. No, no, no. It's it's just one. So, I mean, in the say X one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that should be like a next yeah. one. And in here, the next two here, X two. X one here. X two. 
you might not think the output in it. It's just, and you want to have like universal representation, which is like domain agnostic. But if you, if you want to generate output in it, then like, so, but also, so if you play the first one, and so this is actually like the output of the original paper, I'm saying synthetic images, it was real. <coughs> and, uh, so I am confident. Hmm? Ah, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's a uh, compressed video. Yeah, so that's like normal, right? So but in, but in, you know, but if you if you play it, right? and so so you see that there are like a lot of uh, yeah. Yeah, so like kind of like the artifacts and so on. So it's a uh, no more perfect, but uh, and uh, yeah. What, what is this one? So uh, I just I out of curiosity want to see what, what what if you just don't use the size of consistency, you don't you don't use the shared data space, you just input a source sample and use like a target discriminator to kind of refine the source sample. I just normal that. Yeah, so just a gap to to so technically, it doesn't have to preserve the content at all, but uh, you see that it kind of does. Until you know, ask the question, I can't do that with my mouth. Hmm? Uh, but uh, yeah, so this is the same thing. But uh, what well, I like working. Uh, on to the is to, to extra regularize the constraint the output space. Uh, regularize. <coughs> uh, I didn't understand that you said you did the So you said that you have you as input. What uh, the previous one? No, the, the, the copy one. You just try it. You said that you just have a. So what I, this one with, with, uh, with, uh, so the start guy, so the start guy, you remove this, you remove this, yeah. and then you input the source sample, and then you just just have uh, Translation to the, uh, yeah, then you have like yeah. those generator, and then you have this terminator, which is obviously like target sample as a real sample, and the fake is the one that Yeah? Okay. No, 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 it's, it's like each frame is translated independently. But that could be, I agree that that could be Like that could be like an improvement on the paper, to like have a consistency between the same thing that is good and one and the same thing for it. Yeah, it's like there's a small motion of policy or something like that, that say you want like two frames that are like next to each other to look actually the same, or like the translation between the same, or having like the same classification. So that's what people can do for instance. No. Uh, yeah. 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 In two directions, but I thought you were asking about on the gates. But in general, yes, yes, yes. I, but I don't have any 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 details. But yeah, uh, so 
But what, what I want to mention with, with just and how it's doing it is that, okay, it kind of still learns to preserve the content, even though it looks kind of strange. But uh, the interesting thing is that, I mean, in the past it was shown by the authors that actually adding extra of, of it is as you probably have heard, if you know, guns, that they, they are usually very unstable and they are like difficult to train. But uh, the interesting thing is that many authors show, authors show that if you add like extra objectives to the guns, they actually stabilize, they are a bit more stable. So, like, by doing this, I want to see if actually the network will be like kind of preserving the content or not. And it seems like it kind of does because it's not like we didn't displace the files and so on, because we're still here. But just the outputs do not look as if they could. And uh, I noticed, like, during the training, it actually. If you don't have cycle consistency, you won't have surveys in space, but the uh, training is very unstable. It's like you see this mode collapse, like, and, uh, and with just unit, even after like very small number of updates, but actually the results look pretty reasonable. So that's kind of, I think, the important conclusion. And what I wanted, what, what I'm doing within my team is I, 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 since I, like in practice, my days are more interested of like translating source samples to look as target, like synthetic samples to look as target, as uh, real and realistic. Then uh, the thing is that I actually have like quite a lot of information. So maybe I like the because the cycle consistency assumption, for example, is, is pretty unfortunate. And, and if, if I assume that I want to have like the synthetic data as an input, maybe I can constrain the solution even more. So in particular, I can actually enforce that the ground truth information from the synthetic domain is, is preserved. So in practice, what I did as like I added the extra stuff, extra modules that that's forced to to like kind of drive the solution in, in some complex. And uh, and I have some results to show. And uh, one of the So I would like to play. So, at the top down, you see that the original NVIDIA paper here, and at the bottom, it's with my like extra regularizing the output space. So, you see, like the sky looks actually quite better, and I think some of the details are better. And uh, so, that's like regularizing. Your objective is to teach us to drive. No, like not really. <laughs> it's like, uh, right, if you have this, you can do synthetic data. Yeah, it's a bit. Yeah, yeah. Theoretically, you, you can do synthetic data. Yeah, theoretically, you probably look like uh, you would really like to use. Data to do like any computer vision task, like object detection and so on, and detect cars and so on. But it's not like if you want to learn to drive like end to end with like that network. That's the idea. But uh, I just wondered about the context of the work. So if you're interested in uh, automatic driving, then you do not think to be. Kind of. You do uh, but I mean, because if you train for any task, like object detection and so on, like you 
trying to do like a whole in the data. So, uh, I mean, we, we really want to have like the, the images looking as similar to the, the real images of the body. And so far, it's a still has a general purpose. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and as I mentioned like earlier, the example is like the holders of the hands. Like we can actually like we can think about the tasks that that are like not to like as popular now because uh, if you if you take some data that like, you know average. So you can train maybe people like match the construction or so on because you, you have layers of, of, of like free information about the whole world and it's sometimes it's tricky to label that. Yeah. But uh, it's more like uh, research, it's part of like my master's degree. Deploy of it. So, um, <laughs> okay, so you talked about like uh, using directly the Latin space to learn a uh, discriminator, and that's what actually uh, the algorithm that I to do. Both. So it's um, it's a very simple algorithm that like, I think this one works and it's still the state of the art in the application. So what it does, it's actually again, but on the embedding space. So what you want to do is to find an embedding space that is invariant between the source and the target, but not between the classes. So like an embedding space in which like the points, the source and target points are like totally similar, you can make a difference between source and target, but you can make a difference between the classes. So that's actually what you do if that's why it's an arbitrary method. But what Badadoti adds, it's like two new assumptions. First, it's, like it's always the same, constrain the space of hypothesis. So the cluster assumption says that the decision boundary, if you have like a classifier problem, classification problem, it should not cross high density region. So like, uh, I'm sure like, it should not be like that. Like your classifier should directly be, should, should be like should pass by a low density region, and to that to, uh, in order to have uh, to uh, handle the hypothesis, what you can do is say that the output of your neural net of your classifier should have a very high or very low probability, so it should be sure about what it classifies. And to do that, we maximize, uh, we minimize the entropy of the classifier. So basically, like uh, x log x means like that. So if you minimize the entropy on this curve, on this sort of parabola, it means that you go either to the right or to the left of the probability space. So either you have like very, very low probability or very high probability. So you have like, you're sure, like, like one class or the other class. It is like just the class. And uh, the second hypothesis is virtual and virtual training. So it comes from, uh, maybe you've heard of uh, adversarial perturbations. It's like a big, big problem uh, today in uh, machine learning in general. When you modify slightly an image, and it changes somebody's output. Like you have this example where you put like a sticker or banana in some car or something, and just find it as a poster with like 100% uh, certainty. So it's like a big problem, and some people uh, have handled it with uh, what we call virtual and virtual training, which says that if you modify slightly the input, it should not modify the classifier. So uh, in terms of math, it means that you have the hypothesis for x and the hypothesis for x plus r, where r is like just a slight perturbation, like a slight perturbation of the input space. And what you want to do is to minimize the divergence between uh, the hypothesis on the on the space and the hypothesis on the third body to the space. So that the two actually the two distribution actually look the same. 
So uh, we just two we just two hypotheses. You, what, the, what the algorithm do is it first uh, initialize on the source domain, so you have like a source here and the target that you want. So you initialize on the source, and then you try to minimize uh, the cluster assumption and also like the, all the other things on the target. I mean, the other side of power to try, uh, of course, to make like both the similar, like the source and target the similar, but you also try to minimize the cluster assumption and the visual partiality of the target. And that works very well. Like, so here are some uh, results of the adaptation based on like the benchmark ends SDSM. So those are two uh, very famous uh, DG data sets. Uh, M is just hand to DG, and SDSM stands for street view house numbers. And, um, and what you want to do is if you have the labels only for SVHN, are you able to make prediction on a list? And like the prediction that you are actually able to do uh, represent this accuracy here. Like what's, uh, what's your score on the on a list without any label on a list? Uh, basically, like if you just train it on SVHN and just train for on a list, you know, like 20 or 30, like 40 percent score maximum on, on a, for the transfer on a list. So like the first algorithm in like 2015 had 60% accuracy, then 2016 it was went up to like 88% percent until until 90%. Then in 2017 it went up to like 90-97% percent around. And recently it's like dirty uh, it went like to 99 percent even like the Then we have to find another benchmark. It's like almost as easy as the best way you can have that. And uh, digital, so the optimal transport algorithm I put earlier, and maybe 96.7%, so it completely with the other And so, yeah, as you can see, like, the question has progressed like, very fast. I mean, it's slow. Did you train on SDHM and like, test on Yeah, yeah, that's it. You train on SDHM and test. Uh, but you don't have any other files. You don't have labels and admits, but <coughs> you, you see that just <coughs> don't have any is just the test itself. Yeah. No, yeah. No. Yeah. no, but you also have like adaptations there. Yeah. Because so you, you have labels on SDHAT, so you can train the yeah, image number, five, and so on. But, but you see the, the images, MNIS images. You just don't have the laser for that. So, the uh, actually, there is a contrary, it's harder. There is a contrary, like having labels on MNIST, but not on SVHN. It's a harder problem. And um, there are, like, uh, what kind of benchmark? Because there is this office that one, like this different camera or something like different uh, images on our own, and they can have different contexts. It's like you know, also very possible that one. But it's also like it's also new one. Um, okay. I guess we could take like this realistic and uh, like the realistic and simple data also because we have the one. If you have some adults, also for that, so some people actually use that. To identify the content that can be read, to normal domain application. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah like, um, so all the references of the paper are on this slide, and I put the slide on the website. Yes, and the paper. And uh, like for other kind of resources that are non papers, uh, so I made a blog article about the like, documentation with in 2017, and like a GitHub uh, created list, so like with all the free papers, data sets, results, and documentation. Uh, if you were interested by a flat transport, yeah, like it's a very good library of that, uh, like this link is like a very good prediction. 
and uh, in the context of uh, machine learning. And this book of Joshua of Smart Transport, like, it's sort of very recent book, and it's like it's excellent, like uh, the best, one of the best math books I've read. It's, it's like visual, it's just kind of neural theory, it's like, I mean, it's like, uh, it's like very, very good math book. And there are these books, but there are books like from 2000, and it's like a very much book. So, you like, it's going to be taken, it's going to be taken, it's okay. If you want some examples, and you like it. It was at 1,000 pages. So, yeah. Any questions? No, you are new constraints. So you have new losses, you want like uh, you want to respect the cycle of consistency in that sense. Uh, you want that there is like a shell lattice space, uh, you, want, you want more you expect more things of the other two for some of it. It does like kind of different things like literally like the, the better you can like like describe the desired uh, output, the easier it is to actually find the network. So, yes, uh, and then if you, what, what do you mean? So, yeah. you don't mean about this, right? Yeah. So, in this, in this case, I think that the uh, output and it is a translated source is uh, and similar to you. And then, uh, like, so before we have like the part of discriminator and so on, but uh, I also added like different modules with uh, uh, like enforcing basically curve. So it's more like on this diagram, I might add like different stuff, different, different options here, and go new arrows. But it's it's trained geometry. All the extra losses. Basically, the constraints is usually loss. Like, I mean, constraints is just like I need a new element on the loss. Because, like, the optimization of the constraints is like very hard. So, usually, you relax the constraints by. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That if you, uh, if you can describe the output solution in the more precise way, then it's probably it's easier to, to, to find the thing. Like the smaller the space, the uh, <coughs> easier it is to find the thing. So the like space more than the, the cycle consistency kind of like you know, limits the, the, the space of possible something. Uh, yeah, it's quite a uh, could be an uh, one constraint which you might not have used, but yeah, do I understand it correct that uh, a constraint could be that uh, you're using the uh, clustering uh, argument to show the afterwards to give that to the core, uh, what, uh, what's uh, the block that's a core in one complex could be a, a, a still be a core in the other complex. So it's kind of Yeah, I didn't like the the start of the video before I did it as well. But uh, yeah. kind of going at the the question. Don't be my video. You can put your faces on the website. Yes? Yeah. How about the P? How what? The speed? Uh yeah, how how like, uh like you mean the training or like the <coughs> translation when it's the network is trained? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's pretty fast. So it's like the new frames per second. I think maybe like two, five, even three and four. But uh, the 
brain experience like a different one. That's a different moment. But I guess if you want to deploy it, you have to compress the digital report so that it's yeah, yeah, true, yeah. like for, for like the deployment, it's kind of you can do like a lot of things. Yeah. The goal here was not the speed so we can get my that, but I guess we could but, uh, but the training finally takes an open question. So, so it's like the part of like training days or the on the single day. For the last for the last phase, right? Yeah, for the results I also but in one day you can see how to Yeah, the thing is that that uh, even like <coughs> after like a few updates like the update, you do 100 updates, then uh, the outputs have already made sense. Uh, yeah, but they don't make sense in case that uh, the things that they show that you don't you don't constrain the you don't constrain the output at all. You just have this uh, you just have target discriminator. Then they don't make sense. They kind of compare it to something as you saw, but but it takes like a long time to actually until they produce like some evidence that actually can be really good. Thanks for attention. <laughs> I would suggest that we do like a small break and then we continue with uh, Linus. <coughs>